you know, as a teacher, one of my roles, my name's Justin, by the way, if we haven't met, is to expose and explore and share the why behind God's word. Why did God tell us that? What's God saying? What does that mean for us? And as I walk by faith in my gift that I hopefully give that gives God glory, um, God sometimes tells you to take a right turn or a left turn. And um, to be really honest with you, this is a week of a bit of vulnerability for me, um, someone who's anchored into teaching through a text that gives us a context so that the word and the why of the word would be easy for everybody every week. You can look back and say, well, last week we did this chapter. This week we're doing that chapter. And it anchors us back into Jesus in a way and through the word that is so easy so that the, the realm and the kingdom of man doesn't get involved in the process, right? This isn't just what Justin thinks. This is what scripture is saying. There's these tipping points, though, when you learn enough and hear enough and have been on a journey where God's like, okay, you need to be a bit more of a, quote, preacher and share into the cultural context what all of the whys that we've been learning actually mean for us now. Does that make sense? And so there's moments where you say, okay, I'm going to listen. So I sit down on Monday mornings and I read through the scripture that I'm going to teach that coming weekend. I won't tell you where I read through that scripture in my house, but I sit and I read through that scripture. And I listen for what I might be saying before I even start to study, because I think that's good stewardship of the gift. And I'm just a total nerd. Like, I want to know, what do you have this week, God? What do you have this week? And I usually do that. And what I initially heard from the Holy Spirit on Monday was the book of Acts has been powerful. People are reading ahead. People are getting ahead of it and wanting to come in ready to hear what God's going to say. But I, held, I felt a very strong sense in my spirit, and I'm going to call it the Holy Spirit, of the words, you're done with Acts which is weird for me. And if you know me, like this is not my typical, I don't show up every week and say, I prepared, but I'm just going to do what I want today. Usually want to be a good steward. I heard you're done. And the next thing I heard was what is needed for this season has been given. And so when I heard those sorts of things in my soul, immediately it put me into a state of seeking and listening. Have you ever like felt like you heard something from God and you're like, I better like make sure I really know because I'm going to do something about this. I'm either going to be a fool or I'm going to be full of faith. It's going to be one or the other. And I don't want to make this about me, and I'm going to transition away from me in just a second here. But it's also important that you kind of see the process and that we understand we all have these processes. So I worked my way back through every message that God's given us as a teaching community and then as a community called Newcom through the book of Acts. I went line by line, point for point trail to my study resources. I went through all of it and God started teaching me through what we've taught. And I started to understand what God was up to. And I want to share some of what I believe that is today. But I will tell you that as of today, this week and next week, we are done with the book of Acts. We will start first John two weeks from now. But this week, I'm going to be talking about why God had us go through the book of Acts. Next week, I'm going to tell you how we're going to structure as a leadership to walk with you. I think God is finally starting to tell us how to structure our church. And it's cool. Yeah, it's a great thing. It's emotional because it's a very thin space where I feel like God's very heavy in it. And I can't give you all the answers, but I there's definitely a black and white sketch. <laughs> we'll get the colors later. As I looked through the book of Acts, I found these things. Dory, can you go to the slides if they are available? Right now, here's kind of what we've walked through in the book of Acts. I want you to hear this. You were given a card when you came in, and that card is for you to whatever kind of like wakes you up spiritually or like piques your interest through the Holy Spirit, write it down. Because we believe that when God speaks, it means something. 
So you can go to the next slide, Dory. Here's the Acts of the Apostles' journey that we've been through. Here's the conclusions we've come to through the Word of God that we've worked our way through as a community. Next one, please. The mission of Jesus on earth is not done yet. Revival in the Word... Remember, Jesus taught them before he gave them the Holy Spirit in Acts. The revival in the word precedes a revival of empowerment or in empowerment. So the deeper we go into the words of God, the more we'll have capacity to be empowered by God. The mission of the, of the apostles even could not be fulfilled by or, or could only be fulfilled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. That word witnesses means testifiers in the original language. And as they waited for God to move, they waited for this Holy Spirit to come to them. They listened to the words of Jesus. As they waited for him to move, they devoted themselves to prayer together. We read that in Acts chapter 1. This is how they postured, waiting for God. It wasn't in conspiracy theories or scandal. It was in, no, 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 no. God said he will. We wait. We pray. Next slide. God then sends his Holy Spirit into his people to empower them for ministry, not just develop their character and stay huddled. They ordered their lives then around learning the message and the mission of Jesus. As so many of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were now becoming a community. And that community devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking bread, and prayer. This is the structure or the structures that they built their lives around to ensure that this inheritance they received through the Holy Spirit, the mission, the message of Jesus would endure and sustain through all Things they were about to walk into. And so they devoted themselves to the fellowship, breaking bread, prayer, and teaching of the apostles. And the people of God began to then carry the message and mission of Jesus into their lives. It wasn't just meant for, as we've said in the last 20 years, a holy huddle. They began to live on the playing field. Next line, or next slide, please, Dory. They begin to look at their world, and as they saw their world physical and the emotional needs of others that were around them became a doorway to greater spiritual conversations. This is Peter walking into the temple, right? And he's like, hey, I don't got money, but I got what you need. Spiritual poverty began to be seen as the greatest human need of all of those that were around them. And I'll send these to you or post these or put these somewhere. If you guys want any of these, please just let me know today and we'll find a way. The way of Jesus was starting to be recognized as participating in the healing and the restoration of others. It wasn't being salt and light and leaving people feeling salty and blinded because we shine it in their eyes. It was salt and light for the good taste of the gospel and illuminating the path for others. They participated in the healing and the restoration of others. Next slide, please. Walking in faith continually opened up the new movement in their lives. If they weren't walking, they weren't living. If they didn't move, there wasn't life. So they knew that if they moved and responded to the gospel, that they would see new movement in their lives. And faith called the followers of Jesus out beyond their borders. Without this, the gospel would have died in Jerusalem. Without this, the gospel actually would have died on a cross if there wasn't faith. So they began to believe and behave like nobody in their path was beyond help or hope. That none should perish, said Jesus. And so that none should perish, said them. It's pretty rad. I mean, these are like statements to live by. Next slide, please, Dory. Conversion in Acts is the story of divine interruption, not human power or conjuring. So if you thought you could, quote, convert somebody, it's the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ, not your empty words, but the power of Christ crucified. Don't get in the way of that. Just be a steward. Let God do the growing. You just do the planting and watering. That's what we see in Acts. It's incredible. 
God alone changes the heart. He instigates. We participate. Wow, there's a creed to live by. Where are you moving, God? I want to go there. And in Christ, self-sufficiency is now insufficient. The way that you lived is not the economy of your new life in Christ. You're filled up by him and you live out of that filling rather than filled up with you and trying to generate some sort of life out of that. Next slide, please, Dory. The community grew because the followers of Jesus continued to step out in faith and the leading of the Holy Spirit. This is how it went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and now to beyond and to beyond even to here in our comfy little chairs. The gospel transformed those who followed it. The people of this movement were so changed by the gospel that many were given new names that reflected who they had become or what they were becoming. Peter became the rock. This is the way they saw him. Kepha. Barnabas was given to a man named Joseph because he was a son of encouragement. The way that they looked and lived changed because of the gospel. Can you see how sitting down, reading text, and going into more stories that illustrate this, God might be up to something saying, hey, don't get so far away from the beginning of a movement that you just get lost in the stories of how it affected other people. Can we talk about what it means for us? You can go to the next slide, Dory. Think. What does it mean for you? This is what it looked like for them to walk. They had a kingdom not of this world that was in them, but it was for this world that they were in. Heaven forbid we limit the kingdom of God to a gathering on Sunday for 90 minutes. What does it mean? You can go to the next slide, Dory. Is it blank? Yeah, there we go. Who are we in the story? But who are we? Who does this say we are? What in our lives is making us become who we are? If I just tried to operate in all of those takeaways from God's word that we just listed, I have feeling conviction even saying it. There's a trembling and a fear inside of the heart of a teacher that knows they're speaking of things they can't live up to. But by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit, they will become some of those things. And we should be feeling that, right? Like we should be feeling that inside, like, whoa. I want to dig into some context just a little bit, but I'm not talking about biblical context. I'm talking about the context of what we just heard, and now I'm going to talk about culture for a minute, or a series of minutes. You know, as I look around <coughs> in my regular practice and rhythm of praying around the city, which is normal for me every week, as I intercede for our community, try to figure out how to intercede for my own self, I need his revelation for a lot of that, or really good friends. I see a lot in our city. If I try to walk like we just read about on the screen, I see a lot. What do you see? Just think about it. Put it on your heart. What do you see in the city of Vista, Fallbrook, Oceanside, Carlsbad? I think Rancho Bernardo. We have one family from Rancho Bernardo. What are some of the weights and the burdens you feel, big or small? What do you feel spiritually? What do you sense?
I would say we're in a critical time in our world. You know, Paul in his writing says, make the most or the best use of your time. It's limited. This is our context. We live in our context. We can look back at history and hope for the future, but we literally only have this context. This is what's come to us in our day and age. In Judea and Jerusalem and Samaria and, and the ends of the earth was their context. Ours is now and it is here. And we have the same spirit and the same truth of God's word and the same Jesus and the same father, the same community, the same apostles' teachings. But this is our context. There is an urgency that I feel and sense from the Holy Spirit of God. Not to minimize it into an older story, but it's important to give a pinch of context. Three years ago, I felt a little urgency too, and we sold our building. We put the confined space of what we called church on the market and sold it. But God was like, Step into a new expression as a community. I'm not afraid that we won't change before we move, which is in just a few months. But I don't want to be the same when we get there. And I'm not saying we haven't gone far. And please don't hear any human forms of shame or guilt. I am talking to our table, not your table. I say it in the mirror before I say it to you. The expression that God's called us to was never for us. It was always for him because it was what God was up to. We sold a property because we wanted to be an expression of what he was doing in the city, not our ideas, our will, our way, our kingdom. Shame on us if that's true on any level. I want to walk by faith not copy and paste what I see other people doing that's cool because that's not real. Very, very important for us. We were required to lay down what was old and make room for what was new, so we let go of our property, which we owned outright, which was very foolish in the eyes of the world and obedience in the economy of God. But faith is always a make room movement. I said that a few weeks ago. You literally have to give something up to walk by faith. Maybe it's sight. Maybe it's lean not on your own understanding. Maybe it's you'll go and do what you don't want to do. Maybe you'll say what you feel like you don't want to have to say. There's always making room required for faith. Faith and sacrifice go hand in hand. It's your will sacrificed for his will. Your way sacrificed for his way. I feel an urgency. Look at our vision. I'll put it on the, the screen. Can I say something about vision? God doesn't need a vision. God needs people and his word in those people and the Holy Spirit filling those people. But God, we believe, gave us this vision as guardrails to help us, and guide rails probably better said, to guide us in the specific mission he has for this community. And we say that we're about learning and embodying the way of Jesus. And we do that through being with Jesus, like we're doing now in intimacy with his word and learning from him and being changed, transformed by him, by being new family. So, okay, that's great. So we are, I believe becoming a greater expression of new family in Christ and to be salt and light, to go out and be the salt of the earth and the light in and of the world. But then we land on this last one and where I feel the greatest sense of urg urgency is this salt and light thing. Listen, this is an, this is an ocean of a bazillion ideas. We could be salt and light. We could, we could, and I would say, yeah, it is a notion of a bazillion ideas. Guess what? It's as unique as every fingerprint in here. And it should be. You have purpose on earth with your fingerprints. We'll get there in a minute. I'm so blessed to be a part of this community. You have no idea the 25 years I've walked in the different places that I've walked for me and my journey, and you have years under your belt as well. This place is an absolute gift from God for me. For me, It's like a 
It's a means of God's grace, like a community I've never been a part of, and I'm so grateful for it. I think we're truly becoming an expression of being with Jesus. I believe that. I think in a world where fractured family is the narrative, I think people here, like, they bleed for each other. I think we're, we experience new family here, and it teaches me as someone that carries fractured family. But of all the landscapes of Newcom, I feel like we've just put our toes into the water of being true salt and light. And I think the book of Acts turned my heart upside down. And I'm kind of tired of pretending. And the current version of Justin is about to expire to give way for new, right? That's what I want. Isn't that what we want? Why read God's word? <laughs> Why come? I kind of want to get wrecked when I walk in. By God. <laughs> Just have to make that caveat. A uh, dear intercessory friend said this this week when I met with them. God has given us an ocean and we're standing in the puddle. He's given us an ocean and we're standing in the puddle. This is, the ocean is salt and light. The puddle is what we've come to know it as in our expression so far. This is all grace in this conversation, but it's passion and heart. So you get a little preachy. Sorry. It is on the list of gifts, though, so it's okay. I guess what I'm saying is, like, I believe God has so much more for us. But I'll tell you, it's not ever going to be discovered if the words God has given us don't become more than words. If the list doesn't go from a tablet of a TV screen and be etched then onto tablets of heart. Step back. Look at the cultural climate of noise. Some sit and celebrate what's happening. Others reject, refute, and are broken by what's happening in our world. As you listen to the noise that surrounds us, what value do words actually have when you look at them and hear them? Tell me, right? What value does truth carry in culture? What have we come to just accept that, oh, that's 10% truth and 90% lie? That's just life. Is that what we're called to? Isn't there more than that? Think about words. We claim a bunch of things. Scripture has a lot of words for us. We live our lives based on those words. But culture has a different explanation of what words even mean, correct? And it's not that culture is bad. It's just that there's something perfect and better than what most settle for. There's something real. I read a recent publication that suggested truth is morally overrated these days. Isn't that gnarly? Even my children can tell when I'm lying to them and it hurts them before they know how to think like super rationally. A lie is a lie. The truth is truth. But we have a community growing around us that accepts the lie and the truth in the same box. Integrity between what is said and what's acted upon is a noisy mess everywhere we go. And if you're like me, you struggle to behave according to what you say you believe as well. Maybe even with the mostly truths that you share with others. It's an epidemic. The chasm is huge between words and actions. The consequence on human hearts is devastating. You don't have to search far to find data. People are hurting and broken everywhere, correct? Because of lies and falsehoods. They're without hope. They're owned by pain, anxiety, depression, isolation. Suicide is nearing once again an all-time high, close to what it was in the Great Depression. 
Exposing people, shaming people, canceling people receives high reward in our, in our culture. Truth sits next to lies and nobody can tell which is which, me included sometimes. Vindictiveness and retaliation have become justified behavior and celebrated and you get badges for it in culture. Likes, follows, pats on the back, hugs, community comes from all of that in our world. Everyone's back is against the wall. People everywhere are performing to make it look like they have it all together. And when they can't make it look like they have it all together, they can turn on a filter so they look like they have it all together in the photo. There's got to be more than this. Why are we here? Why did God put us here? There are things to think about. To enjoy 90 minutes, and I'm not coming down on us. I'm trying to expose anything that might stand in the way of the truth and the reality of the gospel having its full 30, 60, 100 fold effect in our lives when we hear his word. To separate out the tares from the wheat, the things of God. Because it leaks in, it's everywhere. We're bored. We go look at, we're at a signal. I can't have said at a signal without turning on my phone and seeing what's happening on social media. Like 17 different times I turn it on before I go through the next, hit the next red light. And it's noise. It's not all bad, but there's noise mixed in there that is weakening me. And I'm not telling you to hide from it. I'm trying to remind us who we actually are in the midst of who it says we are so that we can help. Unfortunately, as a church, we have a badge to wear, too. The church has become a popular six-letter word in culture. Lack of fidelity, lack of fidelity in our words, lack of fidelity between the words spoken and actions expressed in the church have made hope of Jesus become lost in the noise of cultural emptiness and empty promises. We're just another way, another truth, another life. This causes more pain, more anxiety, contributes to depression and isolation yet again. I feel like I have to give a disclaimer whenever anyone asks me what I do for a living. Is this the way it was supposed to be? Here's the crux. I think this is part of what God is going to say to us today, I hope. <coughs> The gospel is the power to change the whole world. And I don't say that like as some like, it's not an abs like this like, um, what do they call that? Like where you just overly elaborate something. It's actually just the truth. But the gospel is communicated in what? Words. Do you see where the tension is now between us as the believing community and culture and how they understand words? The gospel comes by words. It's communicated by words. It's been passed down by words. It's been given to us by words. But the growing population around us believes that words are 90% false, 10% true, that there are many different ways that can be communicated through words that are just as viable as the gospel. And I'm not here to give you some giant apologetic, but I am going to tell you that the words we claim must be lived by, otherwise they will wind up being just like the empty promises that culture gives. Isn't that crazy? And then I started asking myself this week, okay, if I'm going to be like these guys in the book of Acts and I'm going to try and walk this out. And I'm going to try to embody my faith with my actions. Give me some sort of like handlebars, God. And praise God for scripture, right? <laughs> How did God intervene? This is peculiar and powerful, I think. Jesus was called what in John 1? The Word. And then we read that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Isn't that powerful? Like people that don't understand resurrection probably just don't understand incarnation. Like how Jesus came. 
He didn't choose to remain words. Jesus, you know, the one we worship, the one who saved us, the one at whose name every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, that guy. My Savior, the one that I live my life for and to in as fallen a way as I possibly can and as in holy a way as I possibly can. He became flesh. He didn't remain words. He showed us the way, the truth, and the life. The word of God, embodied by faith, proved that the truth of his word was legitimate in the world because he put his flesh on the word of God. It didn't die in Bible study. It didn't die in huddles on Sundays. It didn't die in vision statements. It didn't die in gatherings, in coffee shops, in, prop, in properties, in possessions, in budgets, in church hierarchies. He put his feet on the ground where we walk, and he brought the word of God and made it flesh amongst us. He gave us the way, the truth, and the life on earth as it is in heaven, defeated sin, darkness, and death by embodying the word by faith. That's incredible. Incredible. This is the core of what we believe. The foundation of us is Jesus. One of the best definitions for the name Jesus that I ever heard sitting in some giant conference when I was younger and went to a lot more of those things was, what's the definition of Jesus? And someone in the back of the room yelled out, reality. And I was like, that's legit. Because it's true. Because through him, all that we see was made and without him, nothing that we see, right? Everything came to be because of Jesus. And this Jesus chose to become like one of us to show us the way, truth, and life. Defeat, sin, darkness, and death. And be resurrected that we could have life. And he gave us the same spirit that was in him. That through belief in him, we would be filled and walk in the way of Jesus. In the way of our lives. That's rad. Come on. Like, that's what we're called to. Embodiment of the word by faith brought hope and salvation to all. So how will the gospel words that we claim as truth differentiate themselves from the myriad, dare I say the legion, of other empty words and promises of culture? How? Embodiment. And the only prerequisite for embodiment is God's word heard, obeyed in faith, and operated in, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Those are your primaries. That's all they had. That's where all of those points that we looked through in the book of Acts so far came from, is people just saying, I, I got it. Okay. Yes, God, let's do it. Okay. <coughs> every church gathers, every church teaches, every church has coffee shops, every church does counseling, every church owns some sort of resource and property. But if the people don't embody the words they believe, then the entity is an empty shell. And I don't want to be an empty house. I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about we have to come together and be for the things of Jesus in a world that needs us to be for the things of Jesus. And we're going to need each other because darkness ain't going to let up, but we know that in him is life and that life is the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and darkness cannot overcome it. So we have to embody because we're promised that the overcoming can take place as we embody the word of God. But we won't know unless, I guess I'll be Dr. Seuss here, unless we go. It's true. Embodiment makes a community living. Embodiment proves that the words of God are true, and it's in God's hands to make them be proved true, not ours. He tells us we just have to step out. Otherwise, it's just another way, another truth, another life, another gospel. 
I mean, think about our faith. Think about the things that's been lost in, in the, even these last, like, several months. When I say Christian, most people think politics, not Jesus. Most people think religion, not Jesus. Most people think judgment, not Jesus. Most people think folklore, not Jesus. Someone told me the other day, I think we're just smarter now than we used to be. Like, we don't need God. I'm like, I know that's true for you, but... Christian has been lost in this idea of even tradition. So the call is this, like, we have to become and continue to grow more and more and more as a community of embodiment, and that can't happen without two things. Faith and the Holy Spirit. And so let me rubber meets the road for a minute here. And then next week we'll talk about how we're going to help you. Think about all the names that you read about in Scripture, minus maybe Jesus. How many of them knew what to do before they did it? Basically none. None. So we're a community that knows not what to do if we're going to be like them. But we know about the one that can do. None of them knew what to do. It's called faith. The requirement is trusting God's word beyond what you see and stepping out into it. And we'll help you with the confidence, I promise. But we'll get there next week. I love you deeply. And these are some of the hardest things I ever have to say. And I tried to avoid it all week. But as a leader and as one of your pastors, I cannot step out in faith for you any more than you can for me. Jesus saved you. Jesus leads you. The Spirit is in you. We can encourage each other, spur one another on, stir one another up towards love and good deeds. We can help each other not grow weary in doing good. But the choice and the step is in your will and your volition, not mine. I can preach to break down barriers and walls and, and create pathways that are amazing if God enables me, if he even lets me. But I can't step out in faith for you. And you can't step out in faith for me, but you can see me step out in faith. And you can be spurred on and stirred up. And I can be spurred on and stirred up. Do you remember a year ago we said we're going to have people give testimony? in our gatherings. How many of you have been stirred on and spurred up? You know, I'll just do the comparison game. Even more in the testimony than from the talking head every morning. Me, for sure. It's been way more powerful. It's like more church than anything to me some Sundays. I'm like, that's legit. We need more. We need more testifying about what God's done amongst us. So you say, okay, cool. You run the church. You give us the process. I can't give you steps of faith that God's calling you to. And we'll talk about that next week a little bit. And I would say we have given the process. Did we not just read the process on the screens? The crux is faith. The crux is will our words be embodied? Will we step out in faith and believe? And this isn't condemnation. It's that, hey... Sometimes what I need to be reminded of is just like a fundamental, not like some special move that I'm supposed to do. The fundamentals keep us alive, and we'll talk about that next week. We walked through this year already the Gospel of Mark and the Book of Acts and Jonah in between that. We saw the story of Jesus, the people of God filled with the Spirit of God, walking and living by faith. All of the points in Acts that we just heard were heard and their conclusions from the Word of God. Here's the reminders. You can put up these slides. Story first is faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. So how does your faith grow? The Word. Where does it come from? The Word. Scripture also says faith is a gift from God. 
So you hear the word and you step out into it and it's credited to you as faith. And if you read the Old Testament and the New Testament with Abraham and the book of Galatians, it's actually credited to you as righteousness. God approves of that. God's like, yes, cleared. That's awesome. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But James then follows up with like, you know, you get the jab and then you get the overhand right. But faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Hmm. What do the words in culture match up with? Words that are empty that lead to no follow through, right? I would promise you that almost every pain you have in your life is connected to a promise that was not fulfilled or towards a belief that was betrayed, that something of truth was not operated on in congruence. There was a violation. We have to be a people who live in congruence, not in violation with the things we claim and believe. And I'm telling you, speak the truth in love. I'm not telling you just to use your words. I'm telling you to live the words. Go bleed and breathe and be with people and be an expression of the kingdom of God in their lives. When Jesus says, tell them the gospel, tell them the gospel. Not with words of human wisdom, so you empty the cross of its power, but by the Spirit. Paul says he was so weak, he couldn't even like carry weight with his words. He just told the gospel, and God did the work. That's what God does. This is what glorifies God more than anything on earth, is that when his word is embodied in our lives, he gets the glory. That in us, broken vessels, through following the word of Christ, stepping out in faith by the power of the Holy Spirit, people see it's clearly not something that a normal human being could do, but they chose to do it because they believe in something greater than human beings are. They believe in the creator, and that creator is now creating new and good work through them. This is what God is calling us to. This is part of salt and light is stepping out. And you may be sitting here feeling like, man, <clears throat> I can't. Or I don't know what to do. We'll get to that in a second. If you say I can't, then I say yes. That is the best place to start in the world. Because the bridge between God's word and action in your life is realizing that your will and your way can't and surrender is required. An emptying, remember, a sacrifice is required. And you say, I need your spirit to fill me up and empower me. And I have to operate and act in that reality. This is what glorifies God. You... And this is bad grammar on purpose. You doesn't hold the power. This is what we saw in Acts. Jesus says this to them before he ascends into heaven. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will become my witnesses. And in the Greek, that word is testifiers. And it means living it out in word and in deed. So the power of the Holy Spirit that overcomes weakness of the flesh, even the weakness of, I don't know what to do. James says, just ask, and he will give you the wisdom. Do you see how the gospel has caught every caveat that we put between us and obedience? And we're going to help you with that. And I'll get into that next week. The power of the Holy Spirit overcomes the weakness of the flesh so that we can step out and testify. So I'm gonna ask us something very specific this week. I want you, meaning all of us, to take a week to ask, to seek, and to knock. Listen, I had a guy call me yesterday that blessed me more than anything I did. 
and he was apologizing that he was taking my time. And I was like, are you kidding me? And he brings a work situation that's seemingly unspiritual to me and says, I don't know what to do. Like, can I just get your insight and your, like, thoughts on it? And I'm like, yeah. I was like, I'm on my way somewhere. I've got a few minutes. He's like, well, it's going to take longer than that. And I was like, well, then it just needs to take longer than that. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I'm picking up what you're putting down. There's something spiritual happening here. And he says, tell me what God's up to. Help me discern what God's up to in this. Listen, it has nothing to do with anything spiritual to the natural eyes. But to live it by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit, you have to look past. I'm asking you to look past this week. I'm really good at asking you to ask questions. And can I halfway apologize for that? Because it's really good that we ask the right questions to get to the right answers. But sometimes my care for you gets in the way of me operating in like a spirit of command a little bit. And I think as a pastor and a leader, sometimes I have to lead a little bit stronger. And hopefully today isn't abrasive for you in comparison to my normal soft self. Hopefully you still feel that God's in this. I do. But today I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm actually going to command that we step out in faith because that's what scripture has compelled and commanded me to do. Take a week, ask, seek, and knock. I'm calling you to prayer, maybe to a fast, maybe whatever it is. That we would be a community that's alive this week. And let me just be really frank. It could be like, I've never prayed with my kids before bed and I've wanted to introduce spirituality, but I'm too intimidated and I don't know what to say. God, would you help me? And you go and do that. Or it could be like Eddie and I are going to do in the next couple of weeks. I said, bro, put on your police uniform and I'll wear my uniform, which is pretty snazzy. And let's go to every single business on Santa Fe and let's walk into every business and say, hey, we're from the church that's moving in down the street, and we just wanted to let you know that we love you and we want to be good neighbors. What can we pray for you for? I will not be the same in the community after that. I am sacrificing who I currently am to become who God maybe wants me to be in the city. Do you see how that works? I'm asking you to step out somehow. Now, don't copy my idea, because that would be really oppressive. <laughs> the, guys, the guys are like... Bro, I work at a tire shop. Leave me alone. I'm like, but what I'm saying is take a step that changes the future for you because the gospel will move you beyond your borders and it needs to. Otherwise, we are an empty vessel of a building, right? I don't want to be that. and I'm not coming down on us. I'm coming alongside and we'll talk about more next week. Don't put too much clout in next week. Be with the spirit now. I'm talking about one word at a time, one step at a time, one person at a time, one situation at a time. And that card that you were given today, I want you to take that card with you this week, and I want you to start looking at it now. Bailey, you can cruise up. We're going to take just five minutes and just put some music behind this because that's like makes church stuff cooler. <laughs> but there's actually a spirit that music is used in scripture that holds an environment of a room. And you see that with David, with the king that it calmed down the noise in the mind of the king so he could return to himself. And I believe in the power of music for what it was given to us for. And scripture reveals a bit of that. And so Bailey's going to hold down that space. I want you to take that card. I want you to think, what would it mean this week for you to step across your border? You've already got your passport. It's the Holy Spirit. You can go. But what will it take for you to believe, trust, and step? And then next week, I believe that there will be testimonies. So I'm just going to like believe it. I'm just going to be that guy. And I'm going to believe that next week when we gather, there's going to be a line of people that need to testify about what God's done. And that no longer will a church be limited by the leadership of its pastors telling them how they need to step out in faith, but they will point them to the word and release them in confidence to go out and step in faith by the power of the Holy Spirit and then return and spur the rest of the community on in love and good deeds because that's what testifying is in the community. And I want to be those people. 
See, the music works. I'm not kidding. I think this is part of what God gave it to us for. So that will be next week. And we will get in more to how we are going to organize ourselves as your leadership to truly be your leadership. To not just be a suggestion and to be um, a figurehead and to be an organization, to be with you. And it won't be foolproof, but man, it's a sketch and we're in. It's the way it works. I'm going to pray. Bailey's going to play. We'll just take a few minutes. I want you to look at that card. I want you to say, God, what would it take for me to step out and beyond? What would it mean for me to obey in faith? It doesn't have to be rocket science. And it might be. It might be something massive. It might be something small. But we're asking for steps of faith because we have to be stepping. Because we have to hear the stories of what God's doing. A church is not alive unless God is doing something through and in the church. That's what we want from God. So I'll sit for a minute. I'll come up and close this out in just like a couple minutes here. Just think.
our prayer this morning for us to be led by your love, by your Holy Spirit, for the betterment of those around us. Thank you for your presence here this morning. Thank you for the opportunity we get to lift our voices together and praise you. You are holy, you are worthy, Lord, of every breath. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your friendship, Jesus. Help us to be sensitive to your spirit, Lord, as we hear your word this morning. so much.